For those of you who are uh, logging on to uh, our broadcast during the week, whether it be on Facebook Live or YouTube or, um, let's see, where else do we post? All over the world. Um, or maybe even getting a little bit of this at Soul Forum. Um, we'll be starting in about five minutes, but we want to launch this a little bit early so that folks have a chance to kind of log on and get situated uh, before we get going this morning. So if you're here, welcome. Uh, if you want to fast forward for the next few minutes, uh, you can do that and uh, catch up to when we start the conversation together. Uh, but welcome. Glad you're here today. All right, well, welcome, everybody. You're everybody, so welcome. Glad you're here. Um, 
If you're visiting with us uh, today or jumping on the live stream or you're uh, linking to uh, YouTube during the week, we're glad that you're here. Welcome to Soul Forum. Uh, a couple of quick notes today before we get going. One, obviously we meet here in person every week, so we have folks who have gathered together in this space to be present for uh, this conversation and then to have a little bit of a conversation afterwards. So uh, if you ever want to be a part of that, you're invited to join us right here uh, live as we do the recording each Sunday at 9 a.m. Uh, here at Creekside Commons or Our Savers Lutheran Church. You can come to either space. you land right here. Uh, so feel free to drop in and join us sometime. And then um, in addition today, I want to get us kind of rolling with um, sort of a, a way to think about how to frame what you're thinking about while I'm talking. Because really, I was talking to my wife this morning. I, I was kind of anxious that the content that I want to explore today with you is, I think, really intriguing, but I can't always communicate it super well, right? I can do my best. And so you, you participate in that communicative effort, right? Whatever you're thinking about or reflecting upon as we kind of journey into this content, uh, whether you're uh, shooting out comments on Facebook Live or thinking about it here in this space or even reflecting on it on your own, that is... That is the conversational model that creates this journey into meaning. So it's not, just, it's not just my responsibility to figure this out and spew it your way. It's actually this collaborative effort. And so I'm, I want to invite us all as we kind of think about this this morning to kind of be present for it in a particular way. Uh, because I think the, the content that I was invited into this week that was super humbling for me, I think is an indicator of what we're called to be reflecting on in our time. And as you know, if you've been a part of this for a while, I've sort of committed that this space is a way to kind of think creatively about alternative options of how we construct our religious sensitivities or kind of the soul's journey as we move out of kind of, um, we're not really moving out of the pandemic, are we? But as we move uh, into collective life together, given what we've experienced over the last couple of years. How do we find ways forward that might be new and creative? And I think this is a um, uh, possible one to explore today as well. So um, to set it up, in the spirit of the Beatles, you know their song, Imagine. Imagine that there's no heaven. I wonder if you can. I want you to take some time today as we're talking to think about what if you had to set aside all of the um, structures that organized religion has offered you, or even insights of other wisdom teachers, and you had to find uh, uh, the religious impulse or the sacred impulse in, your, in, in the absolute uh, common experience of your everyday, whatever it happens to be. So if I was an educator, how would I think about the way in which that might show up in my interaction in the world of education? Or if I'm in um, project management, how would, I, how would I find this sacred impulse uh, resonating in that space? So I want you to just kind of imagine today as we're talking about the spaces you occupy, whether it's student or educator or project manager or uh, body worker or a story keeper, whatever it happens to be, what, what might be the impulse of the sacred inside of that realm that you're, you're invited to uh, explore and allow for the, in a sense, its own language, its own rhythm, its own um, kind of power to find its way into that context. So that's what I'm going to try to guide us into today and help us to uh, reflect on when we have a conversation after this is over. And I'd invite you, if you're um, at home watching this, to think about that too for yourself. You know, uh, where's, you know, where, it's almost like, where's God in your grind? You know, your daily grind. And not to think about um, your daily grind as just something you manage your way through so that you can have like special moments on a Sunday morning or special moments in a retreat setting, but that it's, is there something going on in that that you can find? that might give expression to the way you imagine sacred in your life, okay? 
To get us started, I want to read by a, a poem by, um, this is a poem by Billy Collins, who was the, um, uh, he was a famous poet in America for quite some time. And this is a beautiful little poem called Sunday Walk. And it's a little poem about his walk through Central Park in New York City, if I'm not mistaken. And sort of what he's noticing in this walk is kind of what I want us to notice too. So Sunday Walk by Billy Collins. Not only colorful beds of flowers ruffled today by a breeze off the lake, but the ruffled surface of the lake itself, and later a boathouse and an oak tree so old that its heavy limbs rest on the ground. Oh, and I don't want to leave out the, the uniformed campus guard that I saw studying a map of the campus without a student in sight. Closer to town, shops under awnings and several churches, one topped with a burnished cross, another announcing a sermon, quote, what you can take with you. So many odd things to see, but mostly the sun at its apex, inscribing little circles, little halos at the top of the sky, and the freshening breeze, the nowhere it came from, and the nowhere to which it is headed, every leaf wavering, every branch bowed. And what can I do, I heard myself asking, with all this evidence of something, me without a candle, me without a wafer or a rug, not even a compass to tell me which way to face. So my question for today is, how can you take a Sunday walk, right, that is attentive to the character of uh, the ground beneath your feet, taking cues from all the wondrous moments that collaborate to make our realities so that you might see something in there, even if you don't uh, own all the skill sets of religious institution, institutional life or tradition, right? Can you find your way into those meaningful moments? One of the things I love about this season that we talked about last week is it's a, um, it's a season of pregnancy, right? This is a moment, particularly in the Christian tradition and in other traditions as well, where there, there is in the, the um, kind of achy slowness of the dark womb or the dark season, this longing for some new birth to come on board, right? In the, in the Christmas holiday, Obviously, we have Mary who is full and pregnant. Uh, there is life. There is life stirring deep in the darkness of her quiet womb. They are on this road trip to nowhere, it seems. Soon, a baby will be born in a, uh, in a barn in the backwater town of Bethlehem. I mean, there is this sense of, of, uh, of hope brewing in the darkness, but not not embedded in kind of the common religious system of the day, but out on the road, out on a journey away from home, uh, in places that are not normative to give birth, right? That's what's happening in this time of year as we kind of enter into this season of pregnancy. Life finding its way within womb. Life finding its way within the wonder of night dreams for both Mary and Joseph and others. Life finding its way inside of poetry and song that this season is filled with. That's what's going on in this season, these, these birthing stories that literally break out in a new song of life that gave hope to a people thousands of years ago. How can that kind of birth story, that capacity for pregnancy, of holding something that longs to be birthed be a part of our lives. And I, I don't know about you, but that's something I super long for in my own life, right? I want, I want something deep 
down inside to be trying to find its way into my every day that is a new song to sing or a, a new hope to hang some optimism on or whatever happens to be, right? That's what we're all, I think, I think we're all collectively longing for in these times and, and particularly uh, during this season. This is, in a sense as well, a seasonal story that happens every year that reminds us, and, and it's something that I have to remind myself of too, it reminds us that we imagine that however you understand God or the sacred or the holy or the mystery or wonder, or whatever it is that you kind of um, use to construct that in your own sense of self, that manifests itself not as some sort of imposition from the outside, that God doesn't just appear out of nowhere, but births God's self or, or soul self or sacred self out from a body, right? Out from a, a, a literal body, that bodies are able to manifest this gift. And I can only hope, and this is what I'm hoping for us as well, that your body and my body and our collective body has that same capacity. And, and to me, that's the beauty of the religious impulse, that that capacity is present for us. And how can we attune ourselves to that in meaningful ways uh, in our time? This week, I had this experience with Jen, who's here today, that was uh, like super humbling. I, I'd even, I don't, I'm so grateful, Jen, that you invited me to come to your place because I typically meet people for conversations in my space, right? <laughs> in my, my office that's in a religious institution surrounded by th books on theology and religion and the historical Jesus, and, and it, it just drips of uh, religious tradition. And, and that's where I have the conversations. And so many people probably walk in there and are a bit intimidated by all of the, the, the thick religious energy in that space. But this week, um, I was going to meet with Jen, who has been a part of this conversation. And uh, I decided, or she decided, I don't remember how it worked out, but that we we're going to meet at Unbound, which is her uh, training facility here in our local community. It's a room uh, filled with a bunch of weights. So when I walked in, I thought, oh, you know, it's kind of a big weight room in here. And then I started talking to Jen. And... And I, after, this took me a while to reflect on the conversation. It took me a while to get to this place. But in the midst of the conversation, what was really happening in that moment is I was beginning to see that the same kind of religious vibration that happens inside of my institutional uh, arrangement in this space with all of the nomenclature and the language and the, the longings that traditional religions bring to social life at, when they're working at their best was actually present inside of this room of weights. That's why I brought weights today. Did you notice? <laughs> uh, I don't know if you picked up on that. I do these subtle, just a side note, right? I try to do these little subtle things so that you keep you on your toes. Um, inside the weight room, unbound, curious little way to name a company, was the actual like full expression or even capacity to explore because I you know I don't know that we ever find full expression but this capacity to explore kind of the sacred impulse outside of the character of kind of the organized religious world in which I often operate and as I went home and reflected back on it I saw all the patterns just it just like exploding in front of me. Let me give you a couple of examples, right? In this space, you're in sanctuary space right now. That's where we do the recording. And behind me is an altar. And on that altar today, they'll put a, a, a cup, a common cup that people will share for what they call communion in the Christian tradition and a, and a loaf that is broken and shared amongst people, right? That's, that's how this religious institution has manifested that you belong here and that sacred is trying to commune with you here, right? When you walk into Unbound, there's this lobby 
And normally you hide all the coffee crap, you know, in the back corner because it's usually a mess. But no, right on the front lobby desk next to where I'm having a conversation with Jen is a warm pot of coffee and cups so that you know when you're there, you know, you can share in this warmth of communion, so to speak, right? You, you can have a cup of coffee too. It's, it's present for you, just like what's going on behind me. It's like that's, it, it just leaped out at me that this is altar space. And of course, Jen was behind the altar and I was approaching the altar and I felt honored to be in that space, right? That's, that's somebody just starting to allow their space to begin to manifest what might look like a sacred unfolding in the world. But it go, it's more than that. You know, in this space, we talk about, we use language of um, the priesthood of all believers, right? This is a, uh, we're all involved in carrying some gift of the sacred, and we try to harness that together. And in Jen's space, it's about tribal holism, right? That it's a, she's trying to construct a, a company, a community that is collaborative, that you walk alongside of other people seeking wholeness or wellness or trying to transition their physical selves into a capacity to be more uh, capable in the world or more connected to the world or to disconnect them from things that have caused them um, uh, dis-ease in some small way or large way, right? That's, that's what's going on there. It's the same kind of um, like community building that has been going on for generations in all sorts of different religious institutions around the world. And then the last one that I noticed was, and I just, one of these days I'm going to unpack this with her. In fact, we're going to have an interview this week. But this curious title of Unbound, just, I could not shake that. I don't know where she came up with that um, word, so we'll find that out next week. But what a curious way to name a company, right? And I think about, my religious tradition, this, this person of Jesus, right, shows up, and what is he doing but trying to bring healing and wholeness to people's lives by uh, having, allowing them to release from oppressive forces in their lives, to set them free, right, to un, you know, un, help them to live a life that is unbound. And I'm like, oh, my God, this, this is the same religious impulse with different language going on in this little, you know, uh, space in our community that I think makes a difference in people's lives, right? They are, they are running into that impulse in that uh, organization, just like they run into it here. And that's the humbling experience I had, is that I, and I'm inviting you to just give full expression to this, because I keep trying to impose only because that's the world I come from, I keep trying to impose on top of these kind of secular experiences some religious paradigm when I think they actually can hold the full paradigm themselves, right? They can carry the weight of this thing. And, and so what, is, what does the religious life look like if the weight of it can be carried inside of these secular experiences, moments, Organizations, communities, nonprofits, uh, the workplace. Can you trust that you're taking a Sunday walk inside of those places? Can you trust that you're imagining something beautiful and holy in that context? And you don't have to sort of build it on the back of the language set and the metaphors that other cultures, times, and places have used to make sense, of, you know, make sense of it in their time, but out of the very language that is the nomenclature of your own kind of little world, right? Live into that. See if you can live into that space, I think, is the challenge. I will say that I, <clears throat> hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, right? Um, hopefully you're, sometimes I wonder if we're connecting here, but I think we are. <laughs> I think we are. Um, and, and as I did this with Sam not too long ago too, right? Jen is here, so we can always check this out and make sure if I'm on the right track with Jen. But in many ways, I should have seen this coming, right? Because if you think about the birthing places of most of the major religions, they don't take place inside of the institutions. 
that are normative for the time. They always happen. As someone wanders away from those institutions, because those institutions just get just too rigid, right? And then, and then you're, the whole religious paradigm is to sort of adapt yourself, form yourself into that kind of a, a, a pietistic person inside of that system. The, the birthing places of real religious movements always happen outside of that. And the Christianity's like that, Buddhism's like that, uh, Islam is like that. Um, well, you could look at any religious system, right? That's where those, that's the birthing ground for that. That's the womb space for that. And if we're going to try to explore together, and that's what I hope this time is, if we're trying to explore together how might that look today, then we have to somehow lift up what's going on in those spaces for our time and see if we can find that religious impulse manifesting. In the tradition I'm a part of, in the Christian tradition, if you look back at the historical Jesus, what he was up to in his context, clearly he wasn't operating by the rules, the religious rules of his day. That's what got him in all sorts of trouble, right? He's operating in village life, talking to villagers, using their language, using little stories that are birthed out of their context, stories about fishing village life or, or uh, fishing economics or uh, how to plant and grow seed or how to share bread equitably, um, you know, how, how to find something beautiful and sacred even in the broken places of life and bringing healing in those spaces. That births, that birthed an institution, which is great, but I think how do you keep that freshness of revitalization of the religious impulse in a time that requires it is not always to just try to apply institutional realities onto that. But you can really just find it brewing inside of that space. In a sense, you need to tend to your pregnant self, right? You need to tend to your womb space and allow that womb space to manifest itself inside of the daily grind, inside of the actual life experience that you're having, whether you're running unbound or uh, whether you're editing videos day in and day out, whether you're doing body work or whether you're doing construction, whether you're a landscaper, whether you're working for a nonprofit, whether you're a musician or an artist, whatever your uh, beautiful manifestation of life is, linking that, that authentic womb energy to that space, to me, is the frontier in which the sacred can manifest for our time. And so that's everybody's job, right? And, and somehow the collective wonder that comes out of that journey might be the kind of diverse and beautiful expression of the sacred in our time. And while that might be hopeful or abstract, I definitely witnessed it uh, across the communion table at Jen's place, and I bet I could experience it in your place as well if, in fact, you're finding your way into that. Um, I get it too when I get to work with April on editing, right? There's these moments that we have where we're just doing raw work together, but there's something magical happening there, and we can feel it. We honor it. We, we hope it finds its own little expression as it goes to podcast, right? We're, that's just work we're doing, but we're finding the meaning inside of that work. And you can tell when that happens. Um, even the interviews, like the interview I've had with some of you, there's these moments when folks are telling their stories, their life stories, and we, we know that that impulse is all of a sudden the energy in the room. And those are uh, simply just beautiful moments. It is our uh, Sunday a walk in the park. Let me close with just a couple of examples of what I, what this might, you know, how to tether this, and then we'll maybe get in some conversation here. <clears throat> this last week I had a great conversation with one of the people that we've interviewed a couple of, actually months ago now, and uh, he's a university student at a Catholic university. And so he had dropped by, and we were talking, and he was trying to wrap his head around this Catholic idea, which I'm not a Catholic theologian, so I don't quite understand this idea either, but um, it's called transubstantiation. Have you ever heard of that? It's a big, big, long, big, long word, a few nods. Maybe you're nodding at home. Transubstantiation, 
It's a mouthful. This is what I mean by applying religious ideas to the world in which we live. It can get nutty. But as he's unpacking it, what that means is that in the Catholic tradition, for communion uh, service, uh, everybody has like bread and wine. They sit on the altar, right? <clears throat> And in my tradition, the bread and the wine are supposed to kind of stand in for or represent or, or hold what is the life of, of this Jesus, right? Jesus is present for us in this breaking bread and in this shared cup. In Catholic tradition, the bread and the wine literally turn into, so they become physically the, the body of this Jesus and the blood of this Jesus, and so that's why it's managed, you know, very delicately, because it turns into an actual body of the sacred. And you're like, ooh, when did that happen? You know, don't, don't blink, because there, there's a transubstantial. So the substance is transformed. Does that make sense? Transubstantiation. The substance of it becomes something else. It actually becomes something else. And at first, when I was listening to him talk, I thought, you know, that's just such a bunch of woo-woo. I, I don't, is that woo-woo is the right word? I just thought that I don't quite get that. And then I started thinking about this visit, and I'm like, wait a minute. I, could I actually imagine, imagine, pick that term, could I imagine that, like I love to do um, landscape work for some reason, could I imagine that Something as mundane as moving soil around to bring about beauty could be like this idea of transubstantiation that if I'm present for that process in a particular way, that it actually turns in to all the access we've ever had to anything that is divine, to sacred, to holy. Or the book that I'm holding, the story that I'm reading, or the project that I'm working on or the person I'm having a conversation with, maybe I need to trust more fully into transubstantiation that that thing is the thing itself and quit trying to make it think like it's sort of like the object, but it is, it is in fact the very uh, body of the sacred. And would my interaction with that begin to change if I really believed in that. So maybe I'll be, I might become a Catholic yet, um, at least on that front. So that was one beautiful conversation I had this week that I think might help you to frame this, right? Don't hold back when you think about how this works for you. See if you can allow it to fully show up, to transubstantiate. What would that look like for you? And my last example before I close up with a, a reading of that poem again is I got addicted, and that's why the Beatles reference. Uh, Disney Plus is running that um, documentary on the Beatles. How many of you have seen it? Anybody watched it yet? Oh, my gosh, it's a must-see. It's a grinder. It's like two, sometimes two and a half hours an episode. So a lot of sleeping takes place, and you're also watching this documentary. The amazing thing about the documentary is you get to watch the Beatles' creative process at its rawest, in its rawest form. And... The band has not performed together in a long time, I think three years. They're thinking about um, recording an album and doing a, their final live show together. But obviously the band members have matured. They know that the end is near for the Beatles. They, they know that that's coming. And Paul McCartney in particular arrives on the scene and you're watching these different um, rehearsal sets. And Paul McCartney is trying to get the band to generate a new song this is a metaphor, that's why I'm telling you this story. It's not like... <laughs> it, it, Paul McCartney is trying to get the Beatles to uh, create a new song through the old mechanisms and rigid protocols they used to use in the past when they had a manager who was really kind of a driving force in their lives, and that manager passed away. And you can tell that as he's trying to force-fit this process into the band, the band is starting to unravel. You can just see it in their body language, in their faces. They're, they're disconnecting. They can't find their place in the, in the wandering path towards harmony, right? And at some point, George Harrison says, I'm out, and just leaves because he can't take it anymore. And the band is just, and they have to cancel their shows. They don't know that they can pull this off. It's not until... Um, Paul McCartney and uh, who's the other guy that's so famous? <laughs> the, 
John Lennon have breakfast that they hit a they hit a recorder for this breakfast. I don't even know that they were recording them. When he convinces Paul McCartney that he's got to figure out a way that the journey towards the new song has to be collaborative. It has to honor all of the voices in the room. And as you can just tell Paul McCartney is really struggling with this process, but as he softens his approach and opens up this collaborative space, you literally look at their bodies transform and they birth song after song after song that you know so well. And you just watch this beautiful process, sloppy, messy, full of back and forth that births music for a new time. And then, of course, it closes with that great rooftop concert where they begin to play the music for the public for the last time. That moment in my mind, well, the reason I love that documentary is because I think it's a snapshot of what's required of us today. We won't make this unless it's a collaborative global, I mean, just think about fighting the pandemic, unless it's collaborative, global, we, we have to figure out how to do this together, honoring every voice, every diverse perspective, every manifestation of the sacred that's showing up in the nuts and bolts of every life. And I think if we start to move that direction, uh, a song finds its way into the universe. Maybe we learn to let it be. Maybe we learn to imagine in a new way. Sunday Walk. Not only the colorful beds of flowers ruffled today by a breeze off the lake, but the ruffled surface of the lake itself, and later a boathouse and an oak tree so old its heavy limbs rest on the ground. Oh, and I don't want to leave out the uniformed campus guard I saw studying a map of the campus without a student in sight. Closer to town, shops under awnings and several churches, one topped with a burnished cross, another announcing a sermon, what you can take with you. So many odd things to see, but mostly it's the sun at its apex inscribing little circles, little halos at the top of the sky, and that freshening breeze, the nowhere it came from, and the nowhere that it's headed, every leaf wavering, each branch bowed, and what can I do, I heard myself saying, with all of this evidence of something, me without a candle, wafer, or a rug, not even a compass, to tell me which way to face. Whew, isn't that a beautiful little poem? That's a great one. All right, all, well, thanks for the time together. I went a little long today, but uh, we're going to break up in a second, kind of just have a little open conversation about um, some of these ideas and thoughts. And um, I just want to uh, just a quick announcement for those of you who are watching that are linked to Soul Forum. Uh, one of the big um, goals of Soul Forum was to manifest itself as just a pure podcast. And that podcast will launch on the 12th of this month. So all the interviews that we have, um, we try to give um, a little bit more space for it not just to be my voice, but the actual voices of the people we talk to. So you're going to hear their voices integrated into the conversation. And then April Bell joins with them and kind of tries to hear their backstory. What are the life stories that kind of led them to these spaces uh, that give them some insight and some uh, perspective on their own kind of soul's journey? Uh, so that'll all launch uh, on the 12th. You can find it anywhere you find your podcast. It's called Soul Forum. So go find that on the 12th and uh, start jumping in, and uh, we'll find ways to continue to build a conversation around this theme. Okay, thanks for being a part of today.